Hey guys, welcome to this episode of Dental IQ. I'm your host, Fabio Alfieri, and this week I sat down with two guests from one of the biggest dental companies in Australia. Pacific Smiles Group has over 110 clinics nationwide and offers some of the most elite patient care in the country. I sat down with Phil McKenzie, the CEO and Managing Director, and Alison Hughes, the Co-Founder and Clinical Director. We spoke about Phil's challenges that he's faced navigating the business through COVID-19, and also what it's like scaling a business of this size. We then spoke to Alison about her founding story and how she went from one single clinic to growing the business into what it is today. Stay tuned and learn about what it's like to scale a business of this size. Phil, Alison, welcome to Dental IQ. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm personally very, very excited for this episode because I'm a big fan of what you guys have accomplished at Pacific Smiles Group. Um, we're going to get stuck into what the business is all about. Alison, your journey uh, sort of growing the business and Phil, your journey in leading the business currently as the CEO as well. Um, I think for all of our listeners, so they get a little bit of context as to what the Pacific Smiles Group is all about right now. Phil, I think we might even start with yourself. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you've fallen into this role um, and sort of your past experience. I actually, I read somewhere online that you were instrumental in Apple's introduction into the Australian market, which I, I'm sure gets brought up a lot, but I think it's a really interesting point regardless. Yeah, absolutely. Um, g'day and thanks for having me uh, on board today. I'm very happy to share. Uh, Pacific Smile's been around for, for a number of years. Uh, and I'm a, I'm a come lately. I've been involved for nearly three years now. So I'm very happy to share uh, why I joined um, because um, I'm particularly proud to have the privilege of leading the business, what attracted me, um, and very happy to give you my less than grandiose history uh, <laughs> and, and happy to explain what the business is, is today. So in, in short order, uh, when the opportunity to talk with Pacific Smiles came up, um, obviously in a healthcare sphere, very, very interesting. Um, but more than anything, it was the opportunity that Pacific Smiles actually is. So the greenfield rollout of services and facilities for professionals to do their very best work um, was really appealing. Then walking through the business, spending time with the founders, spending time with the um, inception management team, spending time with the board of directors and the chair, um, I became somewhat enamored with the business. Uh, I could see the potential that sits here. Even today, the potential is here. Uh, and the long runway that it has into the future uh, to do good things, as I said, not only in the healthcare industry, uh, but specifically for, for dental. So um, upon having a good look, I decided to, to jump in. I have the privilege of leading the business as the Chief Executive and Managing Director. Um, so we are a, a small uh, but still listed entity on the Australian Stock Exchange. Um, we recently released results for the FY21 year, um, approximately $240 million in patient fees generated in the last financial year uh, and about $33 million in, in EBITDA profit uh, with net profit being around about $14 million. So we're a small business by comparison, but certainly significant um, within the industry as a, a, a multi-site operator. Wow. Uh, in terms of my background, <laughs> well, I, the, um, I, I would yeah. small is probably a little bit of an understatement, but I completely understand where you're coming from. I, what's the market share in Australia at the moment, if you don't mind me asking? Is it about 2%, oh, maybe more? Yeah, now? we'd be of a $10 billion industry, we'd say we've got 2.4, you know, yeah. based on the numbers. Right. Um, and, and they're colloquial terms in terms of t $10 billion to, and, and what's inclusive in that. But we're, we're, a, we're a small player, um, com comparatively speaking. When you think about a $10 billion industry, you know, 20 odd thousand practicing dentists, we work oh. with about 700 dentists. Mm -hmm. um, so 20, 20 odd thousand dentists working uh, and still very much a, a cottage industry where the, um, the, the, the main individuals are the, um, you know, in colloquial terms, the cottage industry or the mom and pop shops um, really are the backbone of their oral health care uh, component of, um, of dentistry. And, you know, we have the, the opportunity with our service and facilities to invite them in. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit more about that that further on. Um, I, I would I would hate to suggest that I was the guy that uh, brought brought Apple to Australia. I, I'm not. <laughs> I, I had the privilege of of being an early employee. I, I was number one employee here for, for Apple Retail. But um, you know, there's a very sophisticated team of people that brought Apple to Australia, and I just got to to play a a, a small, um, but for me significant role relative to my career. And it was just an absolute privilege uh, to be involved. And ironically, mm. there's many things. Um, you know, from a fantastic organization like Apple that, that flow across into what we're trying to do at Pacific Smiles. So much of that cultural aspect, the focus on the human beings uh, and enabling people to, to live the very best lives, um, whether it be in oral care mm. um, or, or with devices is, is certainly what we're about. 
um, uh, here. So. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's something that's definitely so commendable about Pacific Smiles Group is that typically you see with a, a lot of companies as they grow bigger, the care for the people sometimes starts to slip and they almost become numbers within an organization. But something that it seems like Pacific Smiles has done really well is overcompensate and overinvest in the people constantly and always always try and provide that care for not only the dentists but also the patients that you know are visiting all of these clinics around australia as well so that's something that's so commendable as well um phil in your own words sort of <clears throat> as ceo right now as it stands if you could give us a quick bio as to what pacific smiles group is and essentially how it works yeah, we're a, a service and facilities organization uh that provide uh, just as said, the service and facilities to the dental professional, vis-a-vis -vis making us a dentist service organisation. We operate at today out of 110 either Pacific Smiles Dental or NIB Dental branded centres. We have a further three, soon to be six, uh, HBF dental centres that we operate under a managed services agreement. We work with um, a bit over 700 dentists to um to, to give them the capacity and the space to, to do their best professional work, as I said. Um, the best way to think about it is a, a, a dentist can present at a Pacific Smiles dental centre uh, and jeans and a T-shirt will give them scrubs, masks, gown, gloves, uh, a patient, uh, a practice management uh, software, um, the consumables to, to take care of the patient, the chair, the facilities, uh, the, um, uh, the, the hygiene environment, and then ultimately the billing uh, system on the back end of things and the ongoing patient care. So, I mean, Alison may uh, ch check my, um, my, my, my glossy overview, but <laughs> ultimately the dent is responsible for everything that occurs with the patient and inside of the mouth and, and ultimately their follow-up notes uh, and general recommendations and care for the, for the patient. Mm. Um, but that's, that's us in a nutshell. The thing that I personally find the most incredible about this business setup is that it takes that business concern away from the dentist where a lot of people that go through the education system and they become qualified and they're very skilled dentists, you know, it, it takes that need for them to have to put on their business hat and say, oh, wow, I got to set up a business now and I have to hire people and I have to do this and I have to look at leases and all of these processes of running a business where as now they say they can just focus on elite patient care, which is, I mean, I mean, that's extremely valuable so that you don't, you know, potentially lose those incredible dentists because they're not able to go out there and, you know, apply a business model to their skills. So that's, yeah, yeah that's incredible. For sure. I, I know Alison will talk about the graduate program and we've put more than 90 people through that over the last few years i know she'll talk about some of the tools and equipment and scanners um, but the underlying ethos i think was you know nearly 20 uh, 20 years ago d developed to provide those services and facilities to allow that professional to focus and mm. although setting up um, your own practice may um be, be a dream and a and a, and a, and a focus uh, ultimately the sweat equity that goes into it is perhaps not as rewarding as um as doing your best professional work but that's for each individual to decide for sure for sure well on that note then allison uh, i would love to hear a little bit about how this all started because to what it's grown into today it's an incredible story and i think a lot of people would be wondering you know how did this kick off how does you know how does this go from one dentist in one clinic to a publicly listed company with 110 clinics nationwide so could you tell me a little bit about your education first of all sort of where where did that start for you yeah, sure. I mean, I uh, went to high school here um, in just a very local state school um, in Lake Macquarie. And, and after high school, I basically took a break um, from education and went and did dental nursing for two years out in Walgett. Um, and at that point, I decided, oh, well, it's time to go back to university. And then the natural progression was to go back and do dentistry. So I headed back to Sydney Uni um, and graduated from dentistry in 1992. So um, it, it really started there. Um, as, as soon as I'd finished, I was offered a job at my, um, well, he's my husband now, but he was my boyfriend at the time, but at his dentist. That's, so yeah. I really, yeah, it was walk out of university and walk straight into, into practice. It worked out um, very well. I'm, I'm glad he offered you a job. That's, that's kind of him. <laughs> <as. laughs> it was. Um, it was very convenient. Um, and it just happened to be that... Um, uh, one of the, the partners in that practice um, was Alex Abrahams and um, he's the co-founder mm -hmm. um, of Pacific Smiles Group. So um, that's how I actually uh, was introduced to, to Alex and it all began from there. Wow. So yeah. 
from that job, just to set back a little bit. So from that first job in the clinic with your now husband, what was the transition into owning your first clinic? Was that um, also in partnership with Alex Abrahams? Yeah. So at that time I I worked as an employee practitioner for about four years Mm -hmm. and then I was offered a partnership within that partnership. So um, at that point, uh, Alex, I think was involved in three different partnerships and I just bought into one, which was basically the partnership in Charlestown. So um, with that particular partnership, we had two centres. Mm-hmm. We had uh, one in Charlestown and one in a place called Dora Creek. Um, and then later on when we actually united the the, um, the centres and we became three centres, so when we incorporated and became PSG mm-hmm. um, or Pacific Smiles, um, we basically had three centres to start with. Right, right. Okay. And you were the principal dentist, I'm assuming, at one of them. That was sort of your full-time job, was it? Practicing dentistry in the clinic every day? Yeah, at Charlestown. So um, at that time, I was also um, became a mother. I had two children. So it was basically um, part-time, close to full-time by the time you put in the management side of things. So um, like you were talking earlier about uh, wearing the different hats, uh, we certainly had, it was the, the business owner hat, it was the practitioner hat, um, and then later on became that shareholder hat. But it's it's a juggling act. Um, there's nothing else to, to say mm. for it. You, you compartmentalise, I guess, your life into, you know, you've got to pick the kids up at this time, but you've got to actually be there for the patients at these times. Um, and you're fully focused on that side of things. And then um, as that business owner, you're then fully focused on, on your staff um, and any other practitioners working in the centre. So it's a little bit of a juggling act, but it was um, certainly fun and games. How do you? How did you find that juggling act? Because, um, I mean, let alone being a business operator uh, and also a dentist, but also a mother of two young children, how did you find that juggling act? Because I'm sure there are people out there listening who are potentially going through the same thing or even just deciding whether or not they can go through the same thing right now. What was What was that process like for you? Yeah, I think, I mean, I was very fortunate and then I had a lot of uh, well, good support network. Mm-hmm. So um, I had good family around. Um, our, Alex had the same, um, you know, our spouses were probably quite heavily involved in that support process. Um, but it was it was managing or trying to, as I said, sort of divide your time so that you knew you had family time. So you would actually say, okay, well, when I leave this house this morning and I drop the kids, I'm actually then I'm in work mode. Mm-hmm. So you you basically click from one to the other um, and you end up just doing that on a consistent daily basis. And as soon as you leave the, the workplace, you know, okay, well, I'm back in mama mode. So I'm going to pick up the kids. How's your day, dear? Um, it's, it's, it's actually just uh, moving through those different um, yeah, segments, I think, in your mm-hmm. life. So finding a way to keep them very separate to each other so that, you know, you're leaving work at work and then, you know, once the kids are dropped off, it's it's business mode, the, the business hat's back on. And yeah, so th- that, that makes perfect sense. Um, so with the three clinics that you've got at the time, plus, you know, the juggling act going on, what was, how long until that fourth clinic was open for PSG? Yeah, so we actually, um, we merged the centres, the three centres in 2003. Mm-hmm. And from that point, we actually, so we incorporated at that point. Um, so we actually had, uh, from 2003, we got a board in place at that same year. And then we actually took on a general manager, John Gibbs in 2004. So the year after, um, and it was at that point in 2004, where we actually had the opportunity to do an operations agreement for the two large NIB centers. One was in Newcastle, one was in Sydney. So that was our second, um, purchase, if you like, or acquisition, if you like. Um, so we basically went from three to five very quickly. Mm. And then the following year, we actually did a private acquisition in Foster. And, um, we also did our first Greenfield site, uh, which was in Salamander Bay. So, um, they were quite milestones for us. Mm. I think we had an opportunity when we actually went from our three centers, we had, put some, you know, um, standardised systems across the three centres, had policies in place. And when we actually took the NIB um, operations agreement on, it was a really good test platform, if you like, of us to actually pick up those standardised policies and procedures and pop them into something that was already um, functioning and and see how that would work. And um, that certainly gave us a a view of what an acquisition looked like. And and Mm. there was some 
you know, challenges with that because you've got people that are used to practising a, a certain way and staff that are used to um, a certain set of conditions and policies and, and to come in um, and say, okay, well, we're going to, you know, gently <laughs> move that team and that crew to a new way of, of working um, was quite challenging, right. but it was it was fun at the same time. I mean, the the, the teams in both of those centres were fantastic people, and and I, I guess we were very fortunate for that, mm. um, in that we could work with them and 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 do it in a very supportive way, uh, if you like. Yeah. And then the um, the foster one was very similar in that was it was a functioning centre. It was much smaller scale. It was a single dentist um, in in in. Foster, I'm not sure whether you know Foster, but it's a, a, a lovely, you know, coastal town, uh, quite popular with tourists, but a much smaller scale to, to something in Newcastle and in, in Sydney. So um, that one was, was not too difficult. And then we had our first Greenfield site, which was in Salamander Bay. And, I mean, I remember at the time, you know, John was picking the, the vinyl colour for the floor. Um, you know, we didn't have all of these the project teams that we've got now that still very actually, hands on, uh, yeah, absolutely, and um, so so we were you know almost painting <laughs> painting <laughs> the walls. It was it was that sort of thing, but look, it went well, and and um, we just went from there, and we just grew from strength to strength. I think it took us. We were probably growing at about three centres a year uh, for the next probably ten years or so, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it was just more adding to the. With the crew. That care that you were talking about before, almost picking up the paintbrushes and painting them yourself, it's definitely translated through as the business has grown because, you know, as we were saying before, like that aspect of care for every single clinic is still there today with over 110. So that's that's awesome to hear that that's where it started, essentially. We are still we're very hands-on um, from the beginning. Um, I hear it's a, a term keep coming up and I, I want to clarify. So Greenfield site, is this a site that you've built from scratch as opposed to acquiring? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So we basically just have a, a blank canvas, if you like, mm -hmm. um, and just pop a purpose-built um, fit out and and then go from, from scratch. Mm -hmm. So it gives us the opportunity to actually pop our policies in straight from um, commencement and, and hire the team. So we're, we're fresh. We're all fresh together. Um, it's a new team together, and, and that seems to work well for us. Right, right. I, will, I want to touch on this point specifically in a little bit, um, especially with yourself, Phil, as well. But I wanted to know at this point, Alison, early days of PSG, what was the vision for the business? You kind of knew you had this growing thing that was exciting. You know, clinics are coming on quickly. There's almost a bit of a snowball effect that's occurring. What was your vision at the point? Did you ever think it was going to become what it is today? Uh, look, I, I don't know that I ever thought it would be this big. <laughs> um, um, I think when it was, it was, you know, first, um, we first thought about it, really, it was just, we thought that there would probably be a better way of doing things. And that, that was um, a discussion that was had between um, Alex and his a uh, friend, um, Gena Levich, they basically thought there just must be a better way. So our vision was to create something that we could still provide exceptional services to patients but allow dentists to be dentists um, and to actually be a, you know, a provider in Australia of fully serviced centres um, and accredited centres. That was always a goal for us as well, to be, have a, um, an accredited centre. So our vision really hasn't changed that much. I mean, our, our vision is still very much the same. We wanted to actually um, provide a place where practitioners could be practitioners, mm. where we could actually look after, after patients as best we can and then also look after the, the, the teams that actually support all of this, and that's our staff members, um, you know, to take care of those in the best manner we can. And we knew that um, it was going to be corporate by structure, but we didn't feel it was going to be corporate by culture, mm. if you like. Um, I mean, healthcare and um, corporatisation don't necessarily always go hand in hand, but we certainly wanted to have that structure and the standardisation behind us, but also allow us to be the local dentist, if you like, in the communities where we actually had centres. So it was very important for us to keep that, um, that personal touch mm -hmm. to everything and be really supportive um, of anybody that was in the centres, whether it be the practitioner and helping them to be the best they can be mm -hmm. um, or whether that be the staff member that comes and actually helps us prov to provide that amazing support to the dentists and the patients. So mm -hmm. it was really just about that relationship building and, and keeping it very um, 
well, we call it now the PSG way, um, but keeping it aligned and unified. Um, and, yeah, I mean, we've got a few different terms now that we use as far as that's concerned to describe our culture. Um, and I guess, as I said, we really haven't changed the vision very much. We've just really continued to actually find better ways of looking after dentists and better ways of actually connecting with our patients and better ways of actually treating our staff. Mm. So, or caring for our staff. Mm. So it's just a, an ongoing journey, I, I think I would say. Yeah, that's incredible. It almost sounds like you're still treating the business like it is three, four or five clinics. You know, how can we provide as much care as possible to these individuals, you know, and still make them seem like they're not a big cog in a giant machine, but rather that, you know, mum and dad, small family clinic that um, PSG started with, which is awesome. Um, but speaking of scaling the business and growing, I, I want to revisit this point. Uh, Phil, I'd actually like to hear your thoughts on it specifically as well. So early days was acquisition, right? But now it's more focused on greenfield sites. So is there any more acquisition occurring of clinics or is it purely let's get a blank canvas, let's open up something with a uh, uh, PSG on the front door as our uh, branding name. Yeah, you, we, we'd never say never to looking at an opportunity, but it's not our preferred methodology. Um, with any acquisition and, and in other organisations, I've had the privilege of spending other people's money to buy up healthcare practices, optical or audiology. Um, you're typically buying a culture, a set of equipment, a practice management software, a set of professionals, a set of support staff that have operated in a certain way for a long time. And while notionally may be interested in joining, um, really don't want to change. Mm. And so what you can end up with quite quickly is a significant investment uh, and, and really a bag of Skittles. You end up with um, all sorts of things trying to be the same, but all sorts of different flavors. Uh, mm. And it, it doesn't work for a homogenous, consistent application to the professional, to the back end services, or ultimately to the patient experience. That's not to say that um, the experience of acquisition is negative, but I think you have to choose to be efficiently and effective one or the other. And Pacific Smiles over time has defined a, a very good formula for what we call Greenfield or common language Greenfield, where we look for about 150 to 160 square metres inside a shopping centre. We seek to put five surgeries on the ground, um, so five surgeries on, commission three surgeries up front, uh, and that then allows us to... Um, to get the ball rolling, so to speak. Mm. Um, typically at the five year mark, um, we're generating about two and a half million dollars in patient fees and generating about a half a million dollars worth of EBITDA. Um, the idea is that we um, hire people from within the local community um, so that it is serviced and referenced by people that can take pride in their own dental center, um, have their family and friends attend where they work and where they deliver healthcare in their community. Uh, and really do become that, as it says behind me, the local dentist. Mm. So a couple of things that we, we nuance is we have a family and friends opening night um, before we open to the public or to the regular members of the community, because this is where people will be spending, you know, eight plus hours a day as dentists and support staff. Uh, and we want their families and friends to come in and see what the whole story is going to be about. So mm. we've done this now 110 times and a few times in the West. And it's a, it's a formula that uh, I haven't, changed um it yep. was in place before i arrived you know you know people like um uh paul robertson our chief operating officer people like john gibbs before me who sat the chief executive chair honed this thing over time now we've maybe bought some some nuances to things we may have remind, refined and and simplified some aspects of it but this is a tried and tested methodology that's really the cornerstone of pacific smiles mm. and you talk about the the care of, of people um you know, being founded by dentists for dentists um, is fundamental to understanding what the professional needs. But you'll hear us talk about our most important resources, our people, and, and that's not a throwaway line because anybody can build a centre. Anybody can buy consumables. Most people can probably find some patients, but the collection of people that um, have been assembled um, on the team at Pacific Smiles is a real privilege to lead. And um, yeah. and you cut them and they bleed They bleed blue, right? They bleed mm. Pacific Smiles and it's pretty cool. Yeah. And I, I suppose that's why you would probably prefer the Greenfield method as opposed to the acquisition one, because you get to at least ingrain that culture from day one. Do you know what I mean? Like that's your... your planting people in there, like you said, from the local community with who believe in the business and believe in what they can do. And that's it from day one, as opposed to trying to change a formula that had already pre-existed. 
look, if you can get infection control right and appointment book management, and you can do that out of a manual, the most important thing you can do is instill the culture and the set of values that we treat patients and dentists by. Uh, and that really becomes the differentiator and something that leaves us relatively indefatigable to, um, you know, to competitors because you, it's hard to replicate, right? Unless you're Definitely. doing it, it's, it's hard to replicate. And that's been our differentiator. Mm. So, speaking of formula, you mentioned before about you mainly focus on shopping centers, right? Mm. What's the What are the prerequisites that a new site um, is for PSG? So, are yeah. they, you know, are they close to a Coles and Woolworths? Are they in specific shopping centers only? Like, what are the, what does that formula look like for a new store? So, new yeah, clinic, sorry. We, we like a neighborhood shopping center. So, um, uh, for, for where you guys are, are, are up your way, we like Burley. Um, that mm-hmm. Burley uh, Stockland's up there. Uh, we like Rabina. We like um, we like Tweed Heads, Ballina, Lismore. Uh, we like that place where locals are going to on a regular basis to do the shopping at Coles or Woolies or Aldi. Um, invariably, we're um, on a secondary or tertiary door. Uh, we like being close to a car park. Um, as I said, about 150 to 160 square meters. Um, proximity to amenities. If not, we'll put a, a restroom uh, inside the centre to make it easy for staff and dentists. And Alison's pretty passionate about making sure that the simplest of things, the simplest of things are the things that we often overlook. A reasonable lunchroom, um, comfortable ergonomics. Um, so we're, we're looking for that. Uh, are we, we're not concerned about what goes on so much around the outside of the shopping centre. Uh, we're looking for um, a good moving average turnover for the Coles or Woolies and we want a good Uh, GLA uh, around to show that there's plenty of patients and potential for patients. Um, But by and large, we've, um, you know, we've got our formula and it works. Mm. Speaking about potential for patients, as you said before, I want to quickly touch on Coomera. Coomera is up my end of the Gold Coast where where I live. Um, That just recently opened in the new Westfield shopping center, correct? It did. Yeah. On Monday, actually. Yeah. 16th. Uh, Awesome. Congratulations. That's that's fantastic. Um, I heard that 700 bookings before the doors were even open. Yeah. Look, um, uh, Kira uh, Rocks, our, our chief marketing officer, has assembled a, 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 an excellent collection of um, marketing expertise uh, that have uh, either come from different industry experience and have learned dental or have a flavor of dental and have learned marketing. And then we've partnered up with um, with, with neat um, groups like Black Diamond Agency to um to facilitate what we call a fairly analog program of, of just being available to talk to potential patients. So invariably we set a pop-up up, which is, um, which is a crude table for, for with, a, with, a, with a great bit of branding on it. And then we have a, um, a, a dental assistant and we have a computer and we have a toothbrush and sometimes a tooth fairy. Uh, and we invite people to come in and, and treat themselves to the best in oral health care in their local community. And, mm-hmm. Look, I'd never want to Skype because, um, you know, you, you're only as good as your last experience. But um, to, to start a centre with 700 appointments um, shows, A, that there's space in the community, B, that our reputation for quality work and quality partnership from a professional uh, is getting ahead of us. Um, and, it, and it really makes the appetite for wanting to open more centres even greater. So mm. here and a team have done a superb job and the, and the infield and centre teams are, are, are bloody excellent as well. Mm. No, the reason that stands out so much to me is because it, it feels like it means that the, the dentists that are within those clinics have mm. 100% of their attention and time devoted to providing the best possible care. And mm. when you scale that to 110 clinics and you're taking all of that juggling, as we said before, out of the equation, that just means more time on better care so that all of these patients that are visiting these clinics, they can be confident in the fact that when they do go twice a year, um, if you don't go twice a year, you should be going twice a year, <laughs> to a year at least. Um, uh, they can actually accept the fact that, yep, yeah, I'm definitely getting the full attention of the best possible care from my dentist that I possibly could be getting, which is just incredible. Yeah, we don't get every minute right. And, and it would be churlish of me to sit here and say, we've got this now. We haven't. Um, it's been honed over time. And, mm. it, and it starts with partnering with the professionals to how they'd like to see their books working with things that we, we understand are, are effective and appropriate for a modern patient and finding the mediums to, um, to engage with a patient that is, is going to mean that we're accessible to them. Um, so, no, not every day and not every interaction is perfect, but um, we, we never stop striving to be better and we never stop listening. I think, I think that's a fair statement. 
Definitely. And as for striving to be better, especially for the, the care provided, Alison, I know your current position is as the clinical director of um, PSG. Could you tell me a little bit about what's involved with your day to day role? Yeah, sure. I mean, part of that is clinical governance. And as you were um, alluding to before, is to make sure that the patient is safe and has a good experience. So um, in our team, we look after the provision of um, dentist education and also the clinical governance side. And to do that, we've got a, uh, a head of education and we provide quite a range of CPD opportunities for practitioners. And um, one of those, which Phil mentioned before, was our insight program, which is for new graduates. So our intent across all of the centres is for the patient outcomes to be as expected or if not better. Um, and to, to help a practitioner who's just graduated from university um, transition from that university setting to the private practice setting in a safe manner. We've got a, a structured program in place. So it's a 12 month program. Um, and we grab the assistance of, of very willing, um, capable, experienced dentists in the centres as well who, who put their hand up to be mentors. And we have a, a program of um, online learning modules, face-to-face -face learning, um, and also this this one to one, if you like, mentorship, which is fantastic, and it just really provides that necessary support for the um, new graduates that are actually just starting, a little bit nervous, may not have seen the volume of patients that they're about to. Um, so mm. we take that, and then for the experienced practitioners, then we have a range of actual um, opportunities, and that would take um, or be set at a level which is above that new graduate level so that they can continue to expand and um, and grow as well. So once you've finished and you join the business, how long is that? Yeah, so it's a 12-month program um, and then mm -hmm. the practitioners usually then stay on and they um, then move into, they, you know, have the opportunities the same as other experienced dentists at that point. So they can elect to, to take up any of the other, um, you know, learning options that are there. So, um, but the... Mm -hmm structured program itself is 12 months. Um, and um, the really pleasing thing about this and which we're really proud of is that the people that actually go through those programs always put their hand up to come back and be a mentor for the people coming behind. And I think that's one of the nicest things in the centres is, is that there is this really collegiate atmosphere and mm -hmm. we all remember what it's like when you had your first patient in the chair and how nerve wracking that may have been. And we all get in and just say, you know what, it's okay. Um, and we've all been there and you're going to get through this first day. Um, and then it comes to the first week. But that handholding is so important for the for the new graduates mm. um, because, you know, that first week can either make you or break you really. <laughs> so... Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, if that, yeah, if that doesn't tell you that you've built a community, then I honestly don't know what will. And that's something actually I've noticed a lot about this industry is everybody has a mentor, yeah. which I love. It's everybody, once they've become experienced enough, is going to look for someone that they can help guide them through those early years. And I think that sense of community on an entire industry standpoint is is unbelievable to see on such a large scale. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, healthcare workers, by by their very nature, um, want to look after others. And I think that that's, that's reflected um, in those, those where you want to take someone under your wing and say, you know, I can help you. In terms of the care, I actually wanted to ask as well, because I'm curious about this. When it comes to, because the dental industry and the technology within it obviously advances so quickly these days, um, as with everything. When it comes to new technologies, for example, digital smile design, things like Invisalign and whatnot, how does the rollout for 110 clinics look like when you ad adopt a new technology? Yeah. So some of those things are treatment options um, and the individual practitioner will elect to provide those treatments and learn. But when you're talking about technology and um, an example would be the, the scanners, the 3D scanners, um, which replace your your standard um, impression material, which if you've had a mouth guard made, you would know just the little plastic mould with the, basically with the goo inside. And then the worst part about going to the dentist. <laughs> exactly. the, the worst part. I'm sure there's a lot of people who agree with me. It was the worst part. <laughs> um, so yeah, well, that's where you just move on to the scanner. So um, for us, we just basically have to have a strategic rollout because, uh, because of the 110 centres, we actually have to think um, quite, um, cleverly about how do we roll this out so that we're we're getting um, the most out of it as we roll out. So 
I guess in this instance, we would look at, you know, where, where are the practitioners that are doing a lot of the high-end treatment that these would benefit? And we might start there um, and then just roll them out one by one. But for us, it's important to make sure that as they're rolled out, that they're, again, well-supported so that we don't just pop something into the clinic and it doesn't, doesn't go anywhere. It sits in the corner and doesn't get utilised. So, again, we actually come back to that training program and make sure that as, the, as they get um, placed into the centres that we have some sort of support mechanism for the practitioners to learn how to use them and then, you know, a connection um, that if you want to either progress further or if you're having some problems, where they can go to to get some additional help. Right. No, that makes perfect sense. Actually, speaking of support structure, this is actually something that I know is probably going to be a very pressing topic on all of the dental industry right now, but I I want to hear from both of you guys a little bit about COVID-19 and how that's affected your business. And Alison, particularly from yourself in terms of how you guys have supported the dentists within the clinics, um, because obviously it's uh, it's such hard times in terms of, you know, patients visiting, you know, losing patients and whatnot, but also Phil sort of navigating what that, you know, what those pressures have been like as a business leader. Um, I mean, Phil, we can start with you if you like. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, we had the dress rehearsal in, in 2020, I think. Um, <laughs> where yeah. there was um, a moment in time where all things ground to a halt and then we got going again. Uh, this one is, is, is an extension of protracted confusion. Uh, we have mm. uh, mo- moments of lockdown, extension, this state's in, this state's out, this state's out. So if, if I was to, um, to typify probably what everyone feels, the, the confusion and the uncertainty. So our job is to distill what's what, uh, when's when, and, and try and make sure that 1,700 staff and 700 dentists are as best informed as, as we can make it. Um, to be perfectly honest, we, um, we get together as an executive every morning uh, and try and distill from the media and the government websites and the public health orders um, both what is happening and what our responsibility is. The primary responsibility of any healthcare organisation um, before we think about commercial dollars is, is public health, public safety, and that includes our dentists, patients and staff. Um, once we've taken care of that agenda item, the very next is to make sure that we can fulfill the duties that we have to our primary customer, the dentist, uh, and help them fulfill their requirements and desires to service patients. Um, not always is that easy. Sometimes there's an expectation that we are able to um, provide services in an environment where it's just not appropriate or even feasible to do it based on wherever um, the, the space may be or, or, or what may be transpiring at the time. Um, so defining what's going on, trying to be really um, quite succinct with the, um, with the communications, and then ultimately being always ready and always on to adapt and react. Um, so if we can create um, an environment of respect for the practitioner, trust for the patient, uh, and I think a, a sense of safety and certainty for the employees, uh, then, then ultimately we're, we're doing the right thing. Do we get it right every day? No, no we don't. Um, <laughs> and we've had some moments where um, we've had to seek clarification or get some help, but uh, thankfully all our people are safe, our dentists are safe, and, um, and our patients feel comfortable to attend. Our minds now um, ha- have got a rhythm to, to operate the business, uh, but my mind is, is fully turned to, well, what does the future look like and what long-term decisions or what, what short-term decisions do I have to make to protect the long-term um, future of the business uh, and perhaps to provide safe haven for dentists that have gone, this is too hard to do it alone. Uh, I think I'd like to club in with some some other like-minded individuals. But Alison leads the mm-hmm. front line um, with with her team on, in terms of nurturing and looking after the professionals. So maybe, maybe more from her. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you covered quite a lot there of what, of what we've been doing, Phil. Um, I think the the main thing from, from our side of things as far as the practitioners and staff were concerned were that we totally get that it would be nervous um, in the clinics um, and that, you you know, you potentially going to treat somebody that you don't know. So we've just got to make sure that we've got all the processes in place. And in the early days uh, last year, I think, you know, the whole executive team just spent hours and hours and hours trailing through whatever information we could find so that we could actually regularly communicate with the the teams um, and and just give them as much information so that they could understand everything um, in in easy language. Some of it was, you know, just trying to get some sort of interpretation that we could say, you know, well, this 
general restriction actually means this um, and just try and, and make sense of it. So it was about just, as Phil said, keeping in, in touch with the public health orders because that's first and foremost what we, we need to do. We need to support that um, for the just for the greater community and then um, trying to support the practitioners' uh, practice in a way that they felt safe to do so. So whether that was making sure we've got all of the appropriate PPE available, whether we've got enough signage around the, the centres to actually um, remind, you know, patients as well um, what their responsibility is as far as, you know, can you please use your hand hygiene when you're coming in? Um, now it's the check-in with the QR codes, so it's having all of those things in place, the, the uh, COVID screening for each and every patient. So the teams are doing, um, you know, thousands of phone calls every week to make sure that each and every patient comes in is asymptomatic. Um, we've got to just make sure that we do everything possible to make sure that the centre teams are safe. So I guess from our side of things, we were having meetings. We've got a general advisory committee um, which looks after clinical governance. So we were having regular meetings as a committee um, through that whole uh, last year to the, through the period where it was first getting going and nobody really knew what it was going to look like. Um, so we, we used those uh, valuable resources and, and then just really made the decisions based on, um, you know, things that were that had good clinical um evidence if you like um mm -hmm. and so yeah, yeah. Sure. so it was just more about actually trying to make them feel um safe and that they were okay to practice um if that's what they chose yeah, to do definitely yeah and being transparent as well as you guys were saying I, I suppose that that's what maintains the trust at the end of the day and and the confidence because the last thing you'd ever want is you know you're your staff to go to work feeling unsafe, yeah. which is just going to project onto the patients feeling unsafe as well. So always being transparent with that information, I suppose, is, is what you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So that's with COVID. Let's, as a hypothetical, say after COVID, um, hopefully sooner rather than later, what's, what's the next steps for Pacific Smiles Group? And uh, obviously you're a publicly listed company. So being, you know, as conscious as what we can talk about as possible, but what, what are those next steps for the business? And I'm happy for either of you guys to, to give me your point of view. I'll start. <laughs> uh, yeah. that, that's, what you, that's what you say. Go, Phil. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, the platform that we have, Fabio, is, um, is so robust and so ready for next. So prior to um, uh, the hiccup that we're having right now, uh, we had a stated objective of increasing to 20 to 25 centres for at the very least next this, this current financial year. We've paired that back to 10 to 15 just because of the circumstances, um, but we will accelerate rapidly. We have the capital to do so. We've got the staffing and resources to do so. We've got the relationships to do so. And and why? Because we've got a 2.5% market share on a, on a $10 billion industry. Um, what we have works. We're primed. We're ready. Um, we're working with 700 plus dentists now. Um, our, our confidence in representing four dentists and service and facilities, but also um, the engagement with partners and new technology, whether it's, um, you know, or organizations working with AI or working with scanning or new technology for molding and, and, and bringing different uh, appliances to market are all things that we're on the cusp of being able to execute uh, on, a, on a consistent standardized level across um, our centers. And, and that's the really exciting part where we're moving the industry forward rather than just servicing the professional. So, um, mm. Alison, I think you, you might even suggest that it's the education of the dentist is, is our biggest differentiator, and I, I think there's so much scope there too. Yeah, absolutely, mm. and I think that's one thing that we're looking forward to after COVID is actually getting some face-to-face -face, um, learning yes. back on the program. Yes. Um, we had to really quickly uh, move everything that was face-to-face -to, -face to a online learning platform, and um, and while you know we had some great teams, you know um, our clinical excellence team just did a great job doing that, but it was um, yeah. it, it will be nice to get back where you can actually get in the same room and have that face-to-face -face interaction because there's nothing um, like that when you're actually trying to learn together. Um, it just, mm. webinars are great, but that face-to-face, -face, I don't think you can replace it. Um, 
Yeah. yeah, especially seeming the business seems like such a big family uh, between all the clinics. So having that, you know, interaction where you can all come together, learn and, in, you know, improve the care that you all provide collectively. I can imagine why that would be such mm. an important facet of the business. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Two very good answers from both of you. That's um, that's almost all of the time we have for this episode. But at the end of every uh, podcast, what we do a little segment called Quick Fire Questions. And essentially, I'm just going to ask a few questions. I'd actually love uh, an answer from both of you for each question because uh, I think it'd be interesting to see how they compare. <laughs> so, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll jump straight in. The very first question is, did you have a role model in the early days of your career? Uh, Alison, feel free to go first. Um, yes, I did. I probably had three role models. Um, my father was a, a medical practitioner um, and he certainly was a role model. He taught me how to be selfless and, um, and also patient focused. Um, my husband was just the most generous person. Um, so he taught me how to be generous. Um, and, and then I would say, uh, Alex, who was, is, was one of my first employer. Um, basically he taught me very early on to worry about the things that you can change, um, and not to worry about the things that you can't. So I think they were the first three, although they were the learnings that I probably took with me when I first started as a dentist and, and carried those on. Awesome. And I mean, the three very valuable things that I'm sure you're passing on to young dentists today as well. So, yeah, that good role models to have. Uh, Phil, your turn. I'd echo Alison in terms of um, my, my parents and, and um, particularly my dad, who, uh, who always said if a job's worth doing, it's worth doing properly. And um, he was also famous for saying, uh, is it safe? Is it sensible? Uh, some of those things I've, <laughs> some of those things I've adhered to, some of them I've dropped. Uh, and then I, um, one of my early bosses um, was a, a lady called Lorraine Caruso, and, uh, and she was uh, a real instigator in authenticity uh, and transparency. And we've talked a bit about that today, but I think as a, a, a young male leader, you feel that you have to know everything uh, and, and demonstrate very little humility lest someone find out that you don't actually know everything. Uh, and you are mm. in complete control. And she was very kind and very generous to me. And um, I'm still in touch with her today. I'm sure Alison will agree. They're probably two values that are very, very important for a CEO of a business, especially at this size. So, no, it's a very incredible sort of lesson to pick up early on in your career. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Um, all right, let's jump to question two. Uh, name one person in your industry whose work you currently admire. Now, that can be the dental industry. Um, feel it could be another CEO, if you like, or just another leader. Um, but I'm happy with anything. Alison, you first. Go on, you first. Oh, I, I actually find this really hard because, I mean, there are so many great people in the dental industry. And I know you just said that it could be outside. But if I look at the dental industry, there's so many great people in the dental industry. And in particular, I would actually um, be calling out several people within Pacific Smiles. Um, and I guess the reason I say that is because you could put a name to somebody external that you have heard of, but in the, in the working with the practitioners, you know, I know the way they care for patients. I know the way they work. I know how ethical they are. And I really couldn't call out one without offending some of the others. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say that it's just a, a big, you know, um, yeah, sing out to all of our practitioners because I think, yeah, they're all like, you know, Yep, that's fair enough. That's a very safe <laughs> answer. We admire everybody at PSG. That's good. I like it. Yeah. Um, you want one from me? Uh, I would, um, oh, without a trite, a, a non-trite answer. Um, look, I'll give you a couple that if you if you googled around inside PSG that would that would matter and make a difference. So, our chief operating officer is a guy called Paul Robertson. Um, he's the most humble man I've ever worked with. Um, he doesn't ever garner the spotlight, uh, and he. Um, he his integrity and honesty is as that as long as the day. So he's a huge introvert and yet manages to uh, command the respect uh, of 1,700 staff that effectively um, work under, under his leadership. Uh, and he has the same impact even in difficult situations with our professionals, his practitioners, uh, our board of directors, and our external partners. So um, just, just mm. to give you one that's really close to home and you can identify with if you look on our website, um, Paul Robertson, our Chief Operating Officer. Absolutely. No, that's a great answer. And typically what we do is we send this snippet to the person that's named and try to get them on the podcast. So we might have to do another PSG episode with uh, Paul and everybody who works at PSG. 
Uh, all right, let's jump to question three. If this wasn't your profession, what would you be doing instead? Um, I think as growing up, I actually always wanted to be a pediatrician. So um, if I hadn't fallen into um, general assisting, I guess that's probably where I would be. Uh, still within the medical industry. That's awesome to hear that that's always been a passion. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've preached honestly and now I have to be honest. Um, all I've ever wanted to be is a racing car driver. So either motorbikes <laughs> or racing cars. I'm so 12 years of age right now. But same, same dreams from since you were six years old. That's good. Yeah. Never let it go. No. Never let it go. That's no. good. I mean, it's not. It's definitely not too late either. That's always. <laughs> that's always something that we could retire into. Oh, it is. Oh, it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Two more good answers, but uh, we'll jump to the very final question. For all of the dentists out there looking to follow in Pacific Smiles' shoes, what's your biggest piece of advice for them? Um, yeah, I think this is probably an easy one in that I actually say this to new graduates um, every year um, and it's just always do the best you can for every patient you see. If you start from a place of good intent and you stay on an ethical path, um, treat your fellow workers well and um, be humble and remember to earn respect, not command it. And I think if you look after these things, um, the money, which is what people are often worried about, it just looks after itself. Yeah, I, awesome. Bit, very hard to, to, to do anything other than... Very hard to follow. Well, to, to, <laughs> the only thing I'd build slightly on is, um, is come see us. Um, we have a number of practitioners that not only make great mentors, but become great friends. Uh, and I would suggest that there's a, a bevy of people that have seen both the good, the bad and the ugly uh, of what the industry has. And, and so, so come, come learn from people that know and, um, and add your flavor too. Mm. We've certainly got an incredible support structure. So for anyone out there listening who, you know, lives in Australia and is looking for something like that, go and contact PSG because, you know, if I was a dentist practicing right now, it's probably somewhere I'd stop by and check out for sure. Um, Phil, Allison, this has been incredible. And again, I really appreciate you guys taking part and um, joining us today on Dental IQ. As I said, we'll definitely be doing another Pacific Smiles episode. So hopefully we'll have you back on soon. Thanks, Thank Matt. you so yeah. much. Thanks very much. Thank you so much for joining us this week on Dental IQ. If you enjoyed the podcast, please follow us and leave a rating. And you can also find us on Instagram at dental underscore IQ. If you'd like to join us on Dental IQ or have any topics that you want us to cover, you can reach me at fabio at dentaliq.com.au. Thank you so much for joining us again. We hope to catch you next week. Dental IQ is produced by Highsmile.